all praises, you know what I mean? You know, speak to the greatest, to, to the most high. Don't start saying a million praises, Sammy, because you don't have enough praises to speak, to describe his greatness. Just say the greatest, you know what I mean? And you're good. I want to tell you something. This is so beautiful. Look what I'm going to read you right here. It says, Our sages liken one who wishes to keep the commandments to a person who's on a mountain in the midst of the sea. On this mountain, there's a great tree whose roots go down to the very depths. There is no fear that the winds will uproot the tree from its place. The person, however, may be afraid that a storm will come and the waves will wash him away and take him into the sea. However, each person can bind himself to the tree and then he has nothing to fear. Similarly, the world is like a sea and the body is like a mountain in its midst. The storm is death. A person is afraid that today or tomorrow the body will be washed away to the grave. God forbid, maybe like this lady Laura, somebody told me she drowned, may she rest in peace for eternity, a sweetheart man, good girl, just didn't really know the Torah, that's why she didn't keep it, Hashem, and you know that, I gotta tell you, if she knew the Torah, she would have kept it a billion percent, she would have been one of your greatest, I promise you that, she had, I told her, I met this lady, I knew her an hour, I said to her, I would leave my daughter with you, that's how much I liked her, bro, that's the energy she exuded, completely secular girl, but nobody cares, her heart was nice, man. I liked her. Hopefully she's okay. I checked on the internet to see if somebody passed away drowning. I didn't see. So maybe God willing she's okay. But I heard not good things. But I'll find out today for sure. The tree is the good deeds that is, is written. It is a tree of life for those who hold on to it. Again, let's repeat. Similarly, the world is like a sea and the body like its... Ma- Similarly, the world is like a sea and the body is like a mountain in its midst. The storm is death. A person is afraid that today or tomorrow the body will be washed away to the grave. The tree is the good deeds as it is written. It is a tree of life for those who hold on to it. Proverbs 3.18 If a person is worthy of keeping commandments, he is bound to the tree of life and he can protect himself from all sorts of danger. 22, my favorite number, sevens is Hashem. And it's all love for eternity, you know what I mean? Listen, I got to read a little bit more out of this book. I like just straight reading from the book. I really might just do my own audio book of Mom Loez and then listen to it when I sleep. I'm just letting you know what time it is, yo, and I'll do it. God willing, with Hashem's help for eternity. So listen, I'm about to break something down to you that is so deep that I came up with today with the help of Hashem Achidush. That I never heard. If somebody else says it, give them the credit. But if not, I'm letting you know. So I was talking to my mom today and I said to her, you know, I said, it's interesting. I say the gay people, when they go to like do gay pride parades, what symbol do they use? They use the rainbow, which is very interesting to me because if that's not a provocation against God, I don't know what is. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because God's destroyed the world because of sins of like homosexuality. You understand? So when he put the rainbow up, it was to let you know, I should be destroying this place right now. But since I made a covenant not to destroy it, I put the rainbow. That's why in Judaism, you're not allowed to look at a rainbow. Because if you look at a rainbow and enjoy from it, you can have a sin for that. You know why? Because Hashem suffers while you're enjoying. That's a problem. You understand? So I'm thinking to myself, wow, man, look at how the Yetzirah tricks these people, bro. The guy will rock a rainbow leotard Yo, I can't, man. I'm about to really. I can't, I can't. I'm talking about my nation, bro. God forgive me, Hashem. Listen, you know what, man? In one of my other videos I spoke about, you're not allowed to speak bad about the nation of Israel. There's obviously exceptions. I would say this could be one of the exceptions. In general, I'm just saying, man, If the Jew, to any of my Jewish brothers and sisters that go to a gay pride parade, I'm telling you, bro, this is how the Satan is tricking you, bro. You're using the rainbow, which is the same symbol that God used to show us that he destroyed the world because of this sin. And he put a rainbow to let you know that he had mercy on the world and he won't destroy it again. You understand? With a flood. That's why, because the emotions flood you. That's why you do that sin. Because you're tempted by a disgusting desire, bro. We got to say what it is, bro. Keep it all the way real. But you're not going to wave with it. I don't know any dude that committed adultery that's waving with it. I don't know any dude that gets angry that's like, let's come to an anger pride march. No. 
only this sin. And what symbol do they use? The rainbow. So I was thinking today, you know what? I said to myself, you know what symbol they should use? A dog. That's how, that's the symbol they should use. They have a lot in common with them. Unfortunately, I'm not just trying to disrespect, man. I'm telling you what the Satan would say at your trial. First, you have relations like a dog. That is disgusting, bro. I really shouldn't be talking about it like this, but I'm just saying it so that people can understand, man. So what, what I'm saying is instead of using <laughs> on their flag a rainbow, they should put a dog. And I'm going to tell you why a dog. Because one of the reasons the dogs is one of the, is the most impure animal is because when they went on the ark, Hashem said to all the animals, don't have relations. Two did. The crow, the raven, and the dog. That's why God in the Torah says that a sale of a dog and the sale of a prostitute, those two sales you cannot use to purchase an animal to make a sacrifice. Or if you want to donate to the Beit HaMikdash, you cannot do it. They will not accept your money. Money that was made from prostitution or money that was made from the sale of a dog. That's what the Torah is saying about dogs. You understand? Now, does it mean that God hates dogs? No, he made them. They're adorable. Sometimes you have emotional dog supports to help people. I've seen those, emo- not the emotional ones. What are they called? The uh, can't remember the name, but you know what dog I'm talking about. Those dogs are unbelievable. I'm telling you, one time I was in the supermarket, there were a million people yelling, screaming, this, this. And this service dog was sitting there chilling. Like it was all love, bro. I've never seen anything like this, bro. It's really amazing to see a blind person and a dog leading him around. And it works to perfection. So that dog is not blessed. That dog is blessed. And that's another thing that I'm going to compare the gay people to. They're nice. They're nice. Just like a dog does chesed to their owner. Gay people, they're nice, bro. They're super nice. They try to help. They're soft. Ask women if they don't like gay people. They'll tell you they're their most favorite people in the world. <laughs> they're nice. We can't say it's not true just like the dog. I'm going to tell you something about dogs that's beautiful. Because I don't want anybody to think Hashem or me or anybody is hating dogs. We're not. We're telling you what the facts are. Having a dog in your house for cleaning up after a dog is disgusting. A Jewish person should not do that. I'm just telling you. That's my opinion. You could disagree. So do it. Go pick up after your dog. And look at it as, a, as chesed like Moshe Rabbeinu. When he used to clean after the sheeps. You know what I'm saying? You can look at it like that. I don't have a problem with that. That's truth. You may, we make a good point with that. No problem. You do that. I don't want to do that. You understand? Also, on Shabbat, the dog might be barking. This and that could ruin the Shabbat. So anyway, what am I trying to say? What I'm saying is like this. Look, there was a dog one time that its owner took him in the middle of a river to kill it. He used to abuse animals, this guy. So he puts the dog on the canoe. He takes him all the way out to the middle of the river. And he goes, to, pushes the dog off and he starts to drown it, you know, holding it down. The dog, I don't know what, kind of squirmed away. The canoe flipped over and the canoe hit him in the head and knocked him out cold. So what do you think this dog did? The dog grabbed him by his shirt and started swimming to the shore. <laughs> and saved his life. You understand what I'm saying? That's dogs. So please, I'm not hating on dogs. I just want everybody to know. I even gave one of my pillows to my neighbor, Owen. Because <laughs> he has a dog, Leah. You understand? I wanted to show him that I'm not have nothing against dogs. Because I think I might have told him this. So I wanted to like show him, you know? Like, look, it's not personal. But I'm just telling you the word of God. That's all it is, man. It's very simple. You understand? All right, man. And I appreciate you guys letting me teach you the word of God. Because it's deep. And when you have the word of God, there's one thing you have that nobody will have. You know what it is? Peace. You know what else it is? Heaven. You know what else it is? Security. You know what else it is? Love. You know what else it is? Amazing things that will happen to you called miracles. You know what else it is? Life to the fullest. Because when you stuck to God, you stuck to Him hard like I am. Wow, wow, wow. You have no idea how I call out to Hashem. It's scary. (laughs) I speak to Him all the time. You don't get it, bro. I'll be by myself in my house. I'll talk to Him like we're chilling. He doesn't answer me back because I'm not no prophet, but I definitely talk to him. And I know he definitely hears me. That's facts. Let me open up my book right now because I got good energy to read. I'll just pop it open to any page. Therefore, Moses said that the reason that the Israelites did not fight with the dome was because they had been commanded by God. Because Asaph had been given Mount Seir as an inheritance in the merit of honoring his father. Proof of this is that they were very much afraid of us. Similarly, when Moses told about the battle of Shichon, 
he began to relate how he sent messengers that they only wanted to go through and that Shichon did not lift, let them. He didn't give them permission. Only then did they fight against them and God gave them in their hands and took all their cities. That's in Deuteronomy 2.29. Moses told all this to teach the people how God watches over Israel. Nothing depends on strength or power as proof we could see that although Sihon, who was a giant and the son of a fallen angel, was powerful, God gave him into our hands. Conversely, the king of Edom was afraid of us and God commanded us not to provoke him. It was even forbidden for us to even step on his land. Look at how Hashem is rewarding Asaph. We passed by our brothers, the descendants of Asaph, who lived in Seir and headed to the Avara, Arava, from Elat to Etzion Gever. Now Moses tells us that after Asaph did not allow us to go through his land, we headed away from our borders, who lived in Seir, and then we headed to the Arava, from Elat to Etzion Gever. So look, Etzion Gever has that name because the people in that place knew how to look at a rooster. They practiced divin uh, divination. And by watching its crowing and its form, that's how they did it. To this, they could predict the future. There are many mysteries in this that most people do not know. With this, they could also tell when it was exactly midnight and also when it was just before daybreak. It is for this reason that this place is called Etzion Gever, since the word Gever, Gever, denotes a rooster. A non-believer one time lived in the neighborhood of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Every day he tormented him by asking him questions regarding the Torah. The rabbi had us to struggle and find answers to his questions. Finally, he decided he would curse him so he would die and he would be through with him. He took a rooster, he placed it at the foot of his bed and said, I will know when God is angry and then I will curse him. During the first three hours of the day, there was one instant when God is angry. That instant lasts for just long enough for a single word to be said. If a person knows that time, his curse will come through. And I remember they said like, okay, so Bill, I'm at one second to do, what would he say? Destroy, that's it. Bilam knew this time, but God did not get angry at that time so that the Israelites not be harmed. Bilam therefore said, how can I provoke an anger when God will not anger? Numbers 23a, Bilam only had power because he knew how to determine the exact instant God was angry and he would invoke a curse at that time. But if God did not become angry, there was nothing he could do. I don't think anybody today has that power to do that thing. And then the things with the roosters, I don't think these things are possible today. Because you have to remember back then, it used to be very, very high righteousness and holiness in the world. So Hashem, to balance it out, has to make the Tumah high. That's why the Sitra Achra is high. That's why black magic is high. You understand? Now look what God is saying. We turned around and passed through the Moab Desert. God said to me, do not attack Moab and do not provoke them to war. I will not give you their land as an inheritance since I already have given them our to Lot's descendants as their heritage. We later see that God commanded us not to provoke Ammon. As it is written, you are coming close to the Ammonites, but do not attack or provoke them. There it does not say, do not provoke them to war. This teaches that in the case of Ammon, all types of provocations are forbidden. You understand? The reason for this stems back from the time when God destroyed Sodom and saved Lot and his daughters. When his daughters saw that no one survived other than them and their father, they thought that God had destroyed the entire world just as he has done during the flood. The older daughter made Lot drunk and became pregnant from him, giving birth to a child who she named Moab. Moab means Naab, from my father. The younger daughter, in a more modest way, did the same thing. And when she became pregnant, what did she do in a more modest way? She named the son Ben Ami, which means son of my relative. She honored her father and did not specifically mention that the son was from her father. God rewarded her for this and forbade the Jews to provoke Ammon, even in an instant that does not does not involve war. In the case of Moab, however, God commanded that we should not provoke them to war, but other provocations are permitted. Therefore, when the Israelites met the Ammonites, they wore their cloaks so that their weapons would not be visible. This was measure for measure, just as the older daughter was more arrogant with respect to her father, the Israelites behaved arrogantly toward her children, just as the younger one honored her father and hid his shame, so the Israelites were commanded to hide their weapons when they approached Ammon, the descendants of ben Ami. What do we learn from this? We learn that the mercy of God is beyond deeper than deep. It really is, man. You gotta be real. Look, he's showing you things, man, that are crazy, man. Pay attention as we continue. The Imim 
lived there originally, a powerful, numerous race, as tall as giants. As giants, they were considered Rephaim, but the Moabites called them Emim. So I'm going to tell you what it means. Emim, Slicha. One may ask a question here. Why is the Torah telling us about the nations that lived in this land before the king of Moab conquered it? However, this teaches us that God performed a miracle for Lot's descendants out of respect to Avram. He drove out the Emim, Slicha, Emim, who had been there from ancient yes, times, even though this was a powerful great nation of giants who were counted like the Rephaim. The Moabites called the Emim, Emim, meaning the fearsome ones. Whoever would look at them would be filled with terror from the word Emma. Therefore, it was not fitting that the Israelites take their land from them. God had given it to them with a miracle, even though this land might have also been fitting for the Israelites. However, since God had performed a miracle for the Moabites because of the miracle of Avram, it is not fitting to take their land away from them. Here's another one. Moab, you know the sins that Moab made? Are you crazy? They're the ones that were involved with the sin of uh, Zimri ben Salu and Kotsri ben Sur. Are you nuts? Do you know what happened? 24,000 people died. I can't remember a time where Hashem killed more people than back in the time of the Torah. Six million Jews, they say Hashem killed. Now, 70, 80 years ago. God, yes, forgive us, Hashem. What would make God bring a holocaust to his children, bro? I think we really need to think about that right now. Let's analyze that. There's only one answer. And you know what the answer is? And it's a sick answer, man. But it's the truth and we must be honest about it, bro. That's what happens when you don't follow God's laws, bro. He's showing you, man. What would make God kill his children? What would God make his children suffer such humility and shame? The answer is not because they weren't nice people. A lot of them were maybe nice. But a lot of them did not follow the laws. They mixed with the Germans. They went against God's laws. I know it sounds harsh. I would only say because it it's written in the Torah. Parshas Vayelech. Go look at it, bro. And you can understand when God said to Moses, meet me by the tent. And they met by the tent and he spoke to him there. And he said to him, there will come a time in the future that your children will provoke me and sin against me and intermarry. And I will send us nation cruel to elderly and to the young and they will destroy you. God forgive me, man, and I will turn my face and steer, I stare, I steer, panai. On that day, I will turn my face and they will say, where is my God? Read the book by Eli Wiesel called Night. It says it in there that they saw a little kid get hung and he was so light that his weight didn't hold enough, so he suffered. It took him like, I don't know, 14 hours till he died. And they said, where is God? And that's exactly what God said in the Torah. Sick. Today you tell Jews they have to keep the Torah or God forbid Hashem will put a holocaust they'll call you fascist, psycho, Nazi, Germany, this, that, they go nuts. But it's all the truth. Don't listen to those people bark, bro. They're anti-God. Usually the Democrats do things like that. You know what I mean? Especially if you're a young kid listening to this, man. Trust me. You don't ever want to be on the side of the Democrats. You understand? I'm not talking about what they did to Trump. Bump that. I'm talking about what they do to God. God says in the Torah, man and man could not be together, forget marry in a public setting. Are you normal? And it also says murder is forbidden. After 40 days, that's it. The embryo now becomes a human soul is inserted inside the embryo. Read the Torah, you can understand. After that, that's an abortion, not allowed. And what are two mainstays and pillars of policies of the left? Pro-abortion and pro-gay marriage. And one thing I love, how they try to trick you, it's sick. Think, think, think. Look what I'm about to tell you. It's pro-life and pro-death. I don't know who made up pro-life, pro-choice. Because the opposite of life is death. So if you're saying pro-life, you have to say pro-death. You cannot say pro-choice. I'm sorry. You want to kill this baby, bro. Ich salek, man. Cannot have mercy on the Democrats, bro. I tell you why. Because they don't have mercy on God's children. You're going to go tell a kid to go be gay? Don't listen to him. He's, he's Iran. He's sick. He's crazy. Don't listen to this guy. No, no. You're going to go convince him to go be gay. You know what kind of punishment you're going to get for that? Clown. Going against God's word. And you think you're going to survive for that? I say that to you with love, believe it or not. But if you say, you know, you're going to answer back to me. Then God will destroy you, bro. I'm just telling you what your end is going to be. Because you can never prosper when you go against the word of God. I pray for you, you get out of it. And you want to get out of it? 
come to me, I'll help you get out of it, yo. You know what I mean? I'll know exactly what to tell you because I study the word of God. I would know exactly how to break it down. I can't say for sure I'll take you out of it, but I'll equip your knowledge, your brain with such knowledge that you would be able to defeat that desire, bro. When the Satan would come to you, just like it would come to me to get mad or to get upset about somebody hurt my honor or disrespected me right away, the Satan, oh, you're going to let him talk to you like that? Oh, this, that. Nah, you got to say to Hashem, may my soul be silent to all those who curse me. Amen. Say amen to that. Seek peace and pursue it. Say amen to that. You know what I mean? <laughs> the Rifaim were a powerful and numerous race, as tall as the giants, but God annihilated them before the Amorites, who drove them out. <laughs> and they live in their place. They are called giants, Anakim. In Hebrew, the word Anak denotes a necklace. They were so tall that the orbit of the sun appeared like a necklace around their throats. Nevertheless, God destroyed them and allowed the Ammonites to inhabit their land. The land of Rephaim that God promised to Avram and his descendants was and his descendants was the land that was controlled by Og, king of Bashan, another son of a fallen angel, giant. The land of the Rephaim is comprised of a very large area. One portion was inhabited by Moab, another by Ammon, and yet another portion was controlled by Og, king of Bashan. The area is called by, controlled by Ammon and Moab were forbidden to the Israelites. That's why they attacked Basham after they offered peace. This was the same as God has done to Asaph's descendants who lived in Seir when he annihilated the Horites before them, allowing Asaph's descendants to drive them out and live in their place to this very day. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, this was very much like what God had done to the children of Asaph. For the children of Asaph, God had destroyed the Horites before them and given them their land until this day. He did the same to Ammon and Moab, demolishing these nations before them. Some explain it in this way. Moses told the Israelites, do not think that this is the land of Rephaim and that we can go and fight and take it from their hands. We may not think this way since this is now... Sorry, this is now in the hands of the Ammonites. Since the Ammonites now control it, we have no authority to take it like we mentioned earlier. We should see this from the children of Asaph who lived in Seir. God destroyed the Horites before them. The Horites were among the seven nations whose land God promised to Avram. However, since the children of Asaph conquered them, it was forbidden for us to take it from the hand. The same is true here. Although this was originally the land of Rephaim, but since it was now been given to the Ammonites, we could not touch it. This was. This is a good story. Listen here. This is deep. This was also true of the Aviv, of the Avim who lived from the Chatzirim to Gaza. The Kaftorim came from Kaftor and defeated them, occupying their territories. The Torah tells us that just as the land of the Rephaim was conquered by Ammon and Moab and settled, similarly the same was done to the Avavim who lived in the Chatzirim to Gaza. They were very beautiful cities like gardens not surrounded by walls. The nation was called Avavim or Avim since they destroyed cities with their strength and made them into the heaps no into heaps of ruin called Aim. They were also given this name since they knew how to smell the soil and know what crops would grow best on it. They could tell what soil would be good for olives, which would be good for dates. They were like snakes who could tell the nature of the soil by smelling it. The word Avim is thus related to the word Chaviyah, which denotes a snake. It once happened that Rambar Bar Chana, I like that name, it once happened that Rabbi Barbar Khana was traveling in the desert when he became lost. He had a guide. The guide took a handful of soil, smelled it, and announced the direction they must go. This guide was from the tribe of the Avim. There was also another reason they were called Avim. Whoever saw them would be seized, seized, with, a, seized with a convulsion. A Avit, trembling out of fear. Some say the Avim were a Yemenite city and were descendants of Eliphaz, the Yemenite, Asaph's son. They left their cities and dwelt in the Philistinian cities, intermingling with them. Since they wanted to worship their God, they were therefore called Avim from the word Ava, denoting desire. Ta'ava, I like that. Ta'ava and Ahava. It's from the same root almost. Why? Because that's what it is. You can either direct it love or a desire. Desire connotates something that you might not be able to control. Love is pure. Some say that the Avim were actually Philistines. We see that just... We see, we thus see that there were five leaders of the Philistines and they were enumerated. One of them was Avim in Joshua 32. Since the Avim were so large, the Kaftarim, who were dwarfs, believe it or not, and round as apples, came and intermarried with them. They gave birth and they came from the Kaftarim. They were certainly very short midgets and they came and killed these. One may raise a question here. Why must we know that Kaftarim are not like the Avim? 
The Torah does not tell us these things. Does not tell us things that are not necessary. It's not empty from you. I like that. Deuteronomy 32, 47. Everyone must realize that the spies had given a very bad report against the land. They had said that it was a very lean land and that the people are stronger than giants so that it would be impossible to conquer them. Moses wanted to teach them that conquest does not depend on strength but on the hand of God. The proof is that the Avim were so much mightier than the Kaftorim. But nevertheless, those who came from Kaftor, these dwarfs who were born from dwarfs, that's why it says the Kaftorim who came from Kaftor, Conquer them This would be impossible To understand logically But when God is involved Everything is possible You understand Now set out And cross the Arnon Brook See I've given you Into the hands of Sichon The Amorite king of Cheshbon And his land Begin this occupation Provoke him into war God told the Israelites Cross the Arnon Brook Begin the occupation Provoke him to war He told the Israelites Not to find Oh he told the Israelites To find any excuse To fight against them Wow Today I'm bringing Today I am beginning to make all the nations Under the heavens fear and dread you Whoever fears of, hears of your reputation Will tremble and be anxious Before you Amen Pay attention I'm about to tell you a crazy secret A husband and wife Who fight to such a level That they want each other dead They will come back in the next world as Siamese twins. Two heads, one body. And it's going to be a punishment for the strife that they had. The beauty about that, which I know it sounds crazy to say it like that, is what? That they get to heaven after they get their punishment. But why get to that punishment? Are you crazy? Treat your wife with respect, bro. You don't like your wife, divorce her and go get another wife. But keep it classy, make peace, what's going on? Please, man. I see so many people fighting. It makes me nauseous. For what are you fighting, bro? Just make peace. Say, okay, whatever. Walk away. And you don't have to talk to them. It's very simple, man. You hold peace in your hands. Don't let it go, bro. Like diamonds hold on to it. Like jewels. Like rubies. Like emeralds. You know what I mean? Like precious jewels, man. Hold on to peace. Because when you're surrounded by peace, it's like you're surrounded by angels of fire. That won't let any negativity enter your space. Only people with pleasant dispositions, the fire will be turned into angels of singing. Welcome and enter to talk to my child. And that's how it's going to be. Follow me as I take you deep right now into a secret that I don't even know what it's going to be. But it's about trees. And the secret about trees is this. When you cut down a tree, it says that the tree yells from one side of the earth to the other. So we see that the trees talk. Now, we also see that the trees communicate. How do I know? I'll tell you how I know. Like I told this kid, Alex, that I was tutoring. Come outside. We went outside. I said, look up. We saw two trees right next to each other. You had to see how the branches were evading each other. I never see anything like it. You'll see. It's very clear. The branches should be smashing into each other. There should be broken branches everything should be crashing like teeth banging into each other god forbid <laughs> but it's not this branch goes this way this one goes up this one goes around this one goes underneath <laughs> because the trees are communicating you don't believe me i'm giving you proof look at some of the experiments they did with trees they did some amazing experiments with trees on the track. and with that i leave you with love with peace with grace and before I go, I gotta mention something about Berchat Amazon because on my last lecture I gave or talk I gave, I kind of went to it. We should play on Gore Stone. We should lead a speed up right to our land. Or I kind of went to it fast. So let me do it a little bit slower and more concise. So with Berchat Amazon, in the beginning, it's basically you're talking about his compassion, his abundant kindness, and that you know, protech et yadecha, and zbiel lechocharetzon. Open your mouth and he will fulfill every desire as long as you follow him and you bless him. And then he'll speak about you, Shalayim, and how he loves you, Shalayim, and for the land and for the food, you know. And talk about how he should bless us with livelihood and relieve us from all distress speedily. 
and he should bless us that we should never be embarrassed in this world nor in the world to come and that he's our father and our shepherd the king of Israel the God who leads us always he has rewarded us rewards us and will continue to reward us eternally with his grace and his mercy and his love and rescue us and give us only good amen and he also says that we also ask him to place love in our heart so we should be close to him in his Torah and fear that we should be afraid to sin. That's what it says. <laughs> they don't believe me. Go read it and you're going to see. And you're going to see. That's exactly what it says. And then it says that we should have the privilege to see Mashiach speeding our days, that he should bless us, that like I said before, give us livelihood and, and he should be blessed to us to every generation and we should be blessed on his glorious throne and he should lead us speedily up like to our land, and he should break the yoke of a person speedily from our necks. He should give us success to our paths. He should make peace amongst us. He should love us. You know, it's a beautiful prayer, man. Bechat Amazon is on another level. Like I said in my other video, get up now and eat bread and say that prayer and get blessed by the word of God. Real talk. I just want to say to all the people that listen to my lectures, especially if you got this ball, God bless. That I just want to bless you and say, may God protect you. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David Amelech, Shlomo, Moshe, Aaron, and all the greats, may that God bless you with peace and happiness. And know that you must earn that peace and happiness. Make yourself a vessel to receive the blessing or send it. I promise you that because he told me that in his Torah and he told you the same thing. Love him, listen to him, sacrifice for him. Show him that you care about him. Show him that you stuck to him like metal to a magnet or like tears to your skin or tears to your eyes. <laughs> you emanate from him just like tears emanate from your eyes. You understand? There was a guy and he had a farm and he had a bunch of animals on the farm foxes and deers and gazelles and this and that and he had a pig and he used to feed the pig the most and they used to get so jealous oh it's not fair it's not fair it's not fair they got oh man he's always giving them extra look how fat he's getting and they were getting jealous Till one day he slaughtered the pig and they got the point, you understand? And the lesson here is do not, and I repeat, do not chase after physical desires and sins because you will get full off of them and be slaughtered for them. Remember that always. Seek peace and pursue it. And if somebody tells you, I'm a tamid chacham, you know how you know if they're Tamit Chacham? Not even by how much Torah they know. By if they get insulted, if you rebuke them. If they do something wrong and you tell them, hey, what you did to that lady in that lecture was wrong. You know, you embarrassed her in public. And they get mad. It's a problem. That's from the Gemara. So if some Tamit Chacham says, oh, that's not true. He doesn't see talking about. <laughs> then for sure you know he's not a Tamit Chacham. Gotta be classy, bro. I guarantee you Moshe Rabbeinu was classy. I guarantee you Yeshua Ben Nun was classy. I, Yeshua Ben Nun used to clean the base measures. Base measures. Mo, Moshe Rabbeinu cleaned the waste of the sheep. Do you understand what's going on? He was a shepherd, humble, and the greatest leader that ever lived, bro. Ah, Moshe Rabbeinu. I already said in one of my past lectures. When Mashiach comes, God willing, I'll be alive. Right now, I'm on that path big time. And guess what? I'm going to see Moshe Rabbeinu. And I'm going to give him a hug and tell him I love him. And that I learned so much from him. How he was willing to give his life for B'nai Israel. Erase me from your book. You have the chutzpah to talk to Hashem like that? Are you crazy? Yes. He spoke like that to Hashem. Not chutzpah. Showing Hashem. This is how much I love them. I'm willing... For you to erase my name for your book, the book of Moses. And Hashem acquiesced when he saw how much he loved his children. That's all Hashem wants. Hashem wants a leader 
that has love. He doesn't have to be the smartest. He doesn't have to know the most Torah, but you know what he has to have? The right ideology to know how to bring the people together. Because when we have peace, the Shekhinah lays on us. And when the Shekhinah lays on you, it's like being surrounded by the clouds of glory. Nothing can touch you, no matter what. They can't even bark at you. Love you, Hashem.